Hey guys, uh, Mike's here, and today I would like to um, show you my most recent game, which I just played about four hours ago. And I want to show you how I use chessable tools to study, and also how to how I use chessable tools to um, review my game. And also, I think the game itself is very very interesting. So. Uh, let me tell you about what I was studying. So lately, recently, I purchased this uh, Lifetime Repertoires Young Gustafsson's E4-5 course. Uh, in, my, in my attempt is to, um, you know, get better, play more solid things. You, you see this is quite an expensive course, $50 uh, regular course, $250 with the video, uh, but it's a massive, massive course with 25 hours of videos. And... Uh, when I got it, it was on sale. Hopefully, we do have a sale at some point soon. Uh, and obviously, this course is by 2600 GM who work with Magnus and other really strong players. So, it's like really, really cool stuff. So, I just got it recently and I just started studying it. And uh, going into this game, this is round number four at our club. I had two and a half points out of three. We play every Friday night, uh, time control 90 plus 30. And I knew my opponent um, uh, very likely to play this Panziani opinion, which is pretty rare. And uh, you see here, this is literally like the only thing I studied so far. So um, here I watched this whole video, which is 39 minutes long. And uh, I watched it to, uh, to X speed, usually so it takes me 20 minutes. And all I did was, <clears throat> you see review, that means I learned the line. So I learned about uh, 10 most important Panziani lines going to this game. So my preparation uh, for this game consisted of nothing but studying chessable course. And um, um, I studied for maybe 45 minutes. Uh, okay, so then I played the game. So my opponent and I, uh, my opponent is 2130 rated USCF uh, at the time of this recording and I'm 2226 um, we played 11 times total I won nine games and uh, I've been very fortunate uh, my opponent is a really good player uh, but I also take him very very seriously because he's one of the uh, two or three best players that regularly play at the club so I tend to prepare and I tend to uh, you know just try try to bring more focus and concentration to this game <clears throat> so after the game um, finished I came home, I entered this game uh, into chess base 15 uh, and then uh, I went to tools and there is an option here create course. I clicked on that and then I in, that is uh, pretty self-explanatory. You import the PGN from chess base and you can create these uh, private courses in Chessable uh, that's only avail available to you or to people you choose to share this with. So, I simply um, and, uh, import, imported this PGM uh, so I could show you the game. And you see here, Chessable allows you like a lot of cool stuff, like you can connect the engine if you want to, but we're not going to do that. Um, I'm going to make a board bigger for you so you could see what's going on. And let me start with this very interesting game. So, e4, e5, <coughs> knight f3, knight c6, c3. This is a very rare uh, opening. Uh, in fact, uh, you know, I've been playing chess for probably 30 to 33 years with breaks uh, here and there. I have never had a single game against this opening, at least not that I can recall. But normally I'm also not an E5 player. I have been um, learning E5. Um, when I say learning E5, uh, learning E5 to be able to play it against uh, 2000 plus level. Like, obviously I can play E5 against lower rated. People, but I really want to get really good at it and there are other openings I play so uh, so as you see as you saw from my preparation I'm only in the beginning of uh, this journey but anyway so I thought it was very likely that my opponent will play Panziani and if he doesn't well uh, I would have to figure things out and so here already uh, there are two um, two very popular moves to face this knight of six to, uh, to attack the e4 pawn and also uh, d5 so uh, Jan Gustafsson recommends this d5 move which is what I played 
So this opening kind of like, why did white play c3? Well, white was trying to play d4. Uh, the intentions are good. Um, unfortunately, black, if black um, strikes at the center uh, quickly with d5, then uh, white isn't so much in time. So my opponent plays queen a4, and now he's uh, already creating the threat of, uh, you know, going uh, knight takes c5 and uh, possibly winning my, my pawn. So there is a lot of moves here, uh, according to Jan, but the one he recommends is f6. So this, that's what Jan recommends. Uh, I also looked up, this is one of the uh, moves that scores best for black, and uh, it's a good move, just guards the 5 pawn. We're taking away the square from the knight, uh, but we're not too concerned because our knight's going to end up going to e7. And uh, this should be 5, so white's threatening to take one c6, and... Um, win at least uh, at least one pawn, so we have to react to it. Knight g7 is planned, and at, at this point, um, at this point, my opponent takes on d5. I take on d5. <coughs> uh, by the way, the other move that White can play here is d3, um, and then it just ends up in maybe slightly better position for Black slash closer, much closer to equality. I was probably going to play bishop b6, and Jan in his course recommends. Uh, d3, uh, for example, bishop e6, castle, and, and uh, um, g5, and or queen d7. So there's a lot of interesting stuff. Uh, you can learn more for yourself in the course if you're interested. I'm not going to bother you with too many side variations. Let me focus on showing you the game. So he takes, I take, and now he castles. And uh, here a lot of players played bishop d7. Uh, in fact, the highest uh, rated opponent that played this as white was uh, Azerbaijani Grandmaster uh, Durabai, I think. I'm not sure if I'm pronouncing it correctly. And he played against Wesley So, and Wesley So played bishop d7 here. I chose e4, just like Jan recommends. And here Jan considers a lot of uh, c4 lines. And I was prepared uh, for those lines. Uh, those lines get a little bit crazy, uh, but very interesting. And black is fine everywhere. Uh, I'm not gonna disclose my opening prep uh, too much in this line, but again, if you're curious, you can uh, uh, study Jan's course and see for yourself. So, knight d4. Uh, I think I have seen my opponent play this move uh, in one of his other games. And uh, this is where my preparation ended about here. Uh, I knew bishop d7 is the only move and a good move. And the, the only other thing I knew was that uh, I'm doing completely fine here. So let's uh, look at my position. I'm the one controlling the center with uh, opponent e4. Uh, I have four pieces developed. Uh, and my opponent's uh, queen side is uh, lagging in development. <clears throat> and more importantly, I'm threatening to take one d4. And uh, either uh, win some material or at least ruin my opponent's pawn structure. So he goes rookie one. Uh, I think. Uh, the best move for him was to take on c6, perhaps. Knight takes, and he can go rook e1, threatening to win the e4 pawn. However, uh, I can just cast alone. Because the problem for white is, if he takes with the queen, then queen takes b5, wins a piece. If he takes with the knight, uh, he wins the pawn temporarily, but now a6. The, if bishop takes on c6, we will recapture with the bishop, and then we have a fork on the queen and the rook. Uh, if he moves the bishop, now we play knight b4. And unfortunately for white, he's already losing. Uh, he's already losing uh, because his queen is hanging, his rook is hanging, uh, and if queen moves, we just take one e4. If he takes knight, we take the queen. So this already loses for white. <coughs> uh, I think uh, top engine recommended move is knight a3 here. And that makes sense because white is behind in development, so it's time for white to start thinking how to get his pieces in the game here. Uh, rook e1, and at this point I took on d4, and now uh, white only has one move, bishop takes d7, anything else uh, I'm just going to take on b5 next move. So he takes on d7, I take with the queen, and now white, white's in the crossroads. Uh, white can capture on d7 or, or on d4. If white captures on d7, it, at first glance it looks very appealing because black skin is uncastled. Let's take, take a look at this line. He has to take the knight. And at this point, uh, honestly, from far away, I was planning this knight f5 move, <laughs> attacking the d4 pawn, white plays rook takes c4, I was going to play rook e8, take, take, <clears throat> and I thought, 
uh, I'm gonna get with the 4 point back and I have a little bit better pawn structure and easier development as well but uh, upon analyzing it with an engine uh, I think d5 um, allows white to keep the equality the much better move for black is f5 <coughs> and after f5 uh, white's really struggling to untangle uh, black's threatening knight c6 with knight takes d4 or knight c6 uh, knight b4 so engine recommends d3 take knight c3 knight c6 attacking the d4 pawn rook d1 bishop d6 take knight b4 rook moves back rook e8 uh, some kind of g3 knight c2 rook b1 rook b1 a5 with a slight advantage for black uh, black is trying to go a4 and kind of uh, fix uh, white's queen uh, side this would be much better than what happened in the game for white but uh, still as you see here black has a better pawn structure and easier game but by no means the game is not over here and uh, all three results perhaps are possible <coughs> however queen takes d4 is a little bit stronger move actually uh, I, I i'm happily going for this uh, uh, end game where we traded queens uh, my opponent has very weak pawns and i think right here uh, my opponent expected me to play a five and perhaps he probably thought that i'm gonna have a hard time untangling my pieces uh, uh, after, upon analyzing this part with an engine, uh, I used uh, Fritz 13 for this, uh, to analyze this game, by the way. Uh, engines, engine says not to worry, 5 is, is fine, black is still better. This is a line the engine gives, something like this. Again, black is better because, uh, because of a better pawn structure and potential pressure on the d4 pawn. But I, I, I played this uh, move rather quickly. I did not even consider playing f5, I just castled long. Uh, like my approach was just let's not overcomplicate things, keep things simple, develop my pieces, <coughs> place my pieces on good squares, and um, you know I wasn't too concerned about this e4 pawn because I realized okay I'm gonna get the e4 pawn back for sure. So rook takes e4. Here I was choosing between knight f5 and knight c6. Both moves attack with d4 pawn, and the way I approach um, this situation is. Okay, I try to compare uh, moves one versus the other. What what what's it what's different? So from f5, knight can go to d6, uh, but then he might be in the way of a bishop. From c6, uh, the knight might possibly in some lines go to b4 and uh, threaten to go to c2. So I chose knight c6 for that reason, and I think it's a, a, a I thought it <coughs> I think it's a stronger move. And right here, my opponent. Uh, could have gone knight c3 to which I would capture a pawn and I think I'm quite quite a bit better here He goes d5 and here uh, according to, to my Fritz engine I committed uh, quite an inaccuracy uh, Which allowed white to almost equalize so <clears throat> The engine thinks a much much better move is f5 putting this rook to a decision and now if, for example, rook retreats to the first rank, well, now we got knight d4. So the important part is we kick the rook away, and now we come in uh, to c2. Why is knight d4 better than knight b4? Because here white does not have knight a3. If knight a3, we can capture the knight, then play knight c2, and we're going to win the rook. Uh, well, if knight b4, knight a3 guards c2. So that is a difference. Uh, if rook retreats somewhere else, for example, rook goes to f4, we play rook e8. A very nice solution, so we're threatening mate on e1. Uh, let's say some some kind of g3 check here. Knight b4, the bishop's hanging. Knight c2 is coming. Knight d3 fork is coming. And in this specific line, for example, black just wins a piece and probably wins a game. So play knight b4. <coughs> knight c3. And here, for example, things are a little tricky. If I simply take the pawn, white takes, I take. Now white has uh, this rook e8 rook e check move. And if rook d8, uh, this will lead to some simplification, which I think white almost equal in this position. And if I play king d7, well, now rook b8, and I have problems untangling my pieces in the back rank. So instead, I found this really cool move, bishop c5, uh, which I thought was really strong. It's a very dynamic move, develops a piece. Uh, now uh, I have various ideas. I'm threatening to take on d5 uh, I'm, and get my pawn back. I'm also in certain lines might play knight d3 and pressure f2 knight c2 is in the cards as well so all those ideas are possible so he plays d4 and this is a really interesting moment in the game 
Uh, <clears throat> there is a temptation to win an exchange. And we can play knight c2, attacking the a1 rook, attacking the d4 pawn. So if rook b1, we just take on d4, and we're just going to be up a pawn. So probably white's going to take the bishop, we're going to take the rook, rook e8. Uh, this was very hard to calculate. I really uh, dislike this type of calculation positions because I have to sit and figure out, is my knight going to get out of that corner? If it's not going to get out of that corner, I'm going to be down material. Uh, the ancient analysis appears to show that uh, my knight cannot come out, but also white cannot easily get that knight. Because for white to get that knight, he would need to play b3 and uh, bishop b2, but this rook e8 move uh, prevents that because like here, if rook moves, rook e1 is made. <laughs> And if bishop e3, well, then he cannot place his bishop on b2. So, for example, b5, rook b2, c6, d6, b4 is the line I analyzed. Uh, engine gives equal. This position is very unclear. And I'm not sure. Uh, I, I, wouldn't be, I wouldn't be happy to play this because he has a very strong pawn on d6. My rooks are not really in play. My knight, uh, who knows if it, he is ever going to come out. So, no, this is, this is not my type of position at all. I don't believe in this. And my slight concern, uh, I, I wanted to play bishop b6 with an idea of, uh, for example, like knight knight a4, I can take on d5 with a knight, and then I have a really excellent blockaded knight in front of the pawn, and my knight's going to be better than his bishop, I can also take with uh, here, uh, but against bishop b6, he should just play bishop e3, take, take, rook takes d5, and uh, in my opinion, this position is a game for two results. Uh, I'm going to put massive pressure on this d4 pawn. White is going to be passive. Uh, very likely white can hold this position, but uh, not fun for white to play this. I played knight d5 <clears throat> because I saw some really cool ideas. Um, for example, uh, white cannot win a piece. If white takes on d5 and I take with a rook, if he takes my bishop, rook d1 is made. Same thing. If uh, uh, he takes my bishop is in the game and I take his knight, he has no time to take my knight because rook d1 is made. This is where my opponent committed um, a decisive mistake. Uh, here he had to be patient and simply play bishop d2, developing move, bishop b6, rook d1, c6. And again, my position is better because I'm uh, putting a lot of pressure on this isolated pawn on d4. Uh, but again, this is not... Uh, lost yet. I think this is holdable with uh, the best play. So this DC move, um, I think he just loses by force after that. It's amazing. The game went for another 22 moves and uh, there is nothing he can do here. Knight takes c3, threatening the rook, threatening rook d1 mate. So he has to stop the mate and move the rook. The only move that does that is rook e1. And perhaps uh, my opponent <coughs> perhaps thought that, okay, you know, he had kind of entangled he improved his pawn structure, he no longer has the isolated pawn, and maybe bishop can be at least as good as a knight. And all of those things are true uh, in a vacuum. Uh, I always tell all my students that in chess, tactics override strategy. Strategically, all these concerns are correct, but unfortunately for him, um, I have a very concrete tactic that just uh, really, really strong. Uh, I did consider playing knight a4 from kind of far away, and then I think he has the c6 move, and he gives up a pawn, but messes up my pawn structure. But then I saw like much, much, much stronger move, which is 92. 92 check. <clears throat> if he takes, I have made. So uh, I think king h1, king f1. Uh, let's actually check this part. Yeah, my opponent said after the game that he thought king h1 was stronger. Now they both pretty, pretty difficult for, for, for white. Knight d4 <clears throat> is perhaps the move he missed. A bit paradoxical move, because at first glance, uh, white might think, okay, we're going to take on c1, rook takes c1, maybe some kind of rook d5. Uh, okay, maybe black slightly better, but not a big deal. Um, but knight d4 is a really paradoxical retreat. Uh, the threat is, of course, knight c2 fork. And white has no easy way to face it. For example, if you move a rook anywhere on the e file, let's say e7, knight c2 attacks the a1 rook, rook b1, now we got a check. He cannot block because of rook takes e1 mate. King e2, rook e1 check. This is a key idea. We come from behind, we win his a rook. And uh, uh, to add insult to the injury, rook e2 check wins the f pawn as well. So this is completely uh, completely lost. Uh, to my opponent's credit, he finds the best move, which is rook d1. Knight c2, 
a very nice solution. So this knight is just, uh, just amazing. He went to c6, b4, d5, took on c3, went to e2, went to d4, went to c2, and uh, uh, it's not over yet. You will see the, my favorite part. So, uh, so uh, white cannot play rook b1, obviously, he's going to drop a rook. So he has to take on d8, attack with a rook. The rook's hanging, rook b1 is forced. And now, if this was white's move, uh, like this white's move, he can play bishop f4. He's probably doing completely fine, uh, but as somebody said, chess is a tragedy of one tempo. And the tragedy for white here is that black gets to invade in the back rank with check at king e2. Now, of course, rook e1 uh, is terrible, because king d2 just gonna win material. Uh, so here we have rook g1 and rook h1. For some reason, engine prefers rook h1, but I think both moves are winning. Rook g1, we're just threatening to take on g2 and at least win a pawn. Um, but the problem is probably a couple of pawns gonna drop. And actually, I think g3, according to the computer, uh, is the strongest move. King d2 or g3. Uh, but I think it's gonna result in similar situation. Yeah, king d2 is a little bit stronger. So maybe um, g3, g3 just loses by force, unfortunately, for him. Uh, I found the exact, exact path. And it's funny to say that, but the reason he's losing this game is his pawn on c5. Uh, you might you might say why. Uh, this pawn is so far advanced that uh, one thing you should always consider when you're playing this uh, active positions is uh, transitioning between different types of end games. And I had this idea that if I can trade everything and go into the pawn end game. Um, I will win this game because my king gets to be more active and this pawn on c5 is what uh, ruins white's chances. So I played knight b4, attacking the a pawn, he plays a3, and here this, this knight is just a monster with knight a2. Uh, really beautiful move. The knight has no moves after that, he can't come out or out of a2, but he doesn't need to because uh, white's bishop is pinned and knight is just going to take this bishop. So king d2, and now very very important move. Um, white is paralyzed. White can't do anything. So we need to win time. We need to bring our king. So in the end game, almost always uh, one of the main rules is to activate the king. So king d7. King is heading towards the c5 pawn. And now it doesn't matter what move he makes. King c2 or rook a1. I'm gonna do the same thing. I take on c1. He takes on c1. I take on c1. And by the way, here it there was a temptation to uh, play rook g2. And win the pawn but uh, after this uh, white's still in the game yeah of course black uh, has extremely hard chances to win but uh, rook end games have a very uh, high propensity to be drawn and it could be held and i'm very very proud of this rook takes c1 move and uh let's see what the engine thinks so this engine actually yeah <laughs> this engine also says rook takes c1 uh fritz 13 uh, like right immediately on my um, four core processor, I believe it says minus two for rook takes c1 and about minus one for rook g2. Uh, but I think rook takes c1 just immediately wins. There is nothing white can do. King takes c1, king c6, attacking the pawn. Of course, if white gives up, that pawn game is over. b4, king b5, king b2. And now, if, if I play something like a5, I think king b3 and he holds. But uh, I think King C4 and King A4, I think King A4, yeah, King A4 was also good. And you see A5 is just a draw, so this is like a very key moment. Uh, so I, be, I have been working on my end games as well, uh, also on chessable, uh, uh, not, not only on chessable, but uh, studying uh, 100 end games mm. you must know and looking at other stuff um, and uh, analyzing mm. a lot of end games as well on my own. And uh, I think my end game play hopefully improved. And this can see four move uh, just just the dagger uh, because now the, the key idea is to play a5 and once i play a5 uh, if white does not guard the b pawn then i'm just gonna take it and win it and his king cannot approach the b4 pawn and if he's not gonna allow me to take then he has to take himself and then i get to take both c and a pawn because they are separated and once i do that i'll be up a pawn and i'm winning <coughs> f4 c6 uh, I think a5 just just as good right away. Yeah, I was kind of concerned about 
c6, but I think I just saw ghost because on c6 I just play b6. And let's say take, take, and I play king b5 and take the c pawn. But this this uh, end game is uh, one of those that it's really hard to, to mess it up. Almost anything wins. Uh, my opponent plays a 5 now this a5 idea. Uh, I think maybe king d5 also was winning, going for this pawn. Uh, I think a lot of things win here. King takes c5. Now, of course, if white does not play a6, I'll play king b5, king takes a5, and then his two pawns will beat his pawn. A6, B, A, he plays King C3, I play H5 in order to kind of slow him down a little bit. A4, King D5, the, the most important thing is to win this game, I just gotta play, just gotta push my C pawn, A5 and C4. And basically, uh, he resigned here, but uh, if he doesn't resign, then I'm just gonna, I'm just gonna play um, um, King D4 and uh, eventually at the right moment, uh, like very many ways to win this, but I could abandon my C pawn and uh, come after his uh, king's side pawns. Uh, for example, so I'm gonna uh, use chessable to show you uh, how to analyze position. So there is this uh, button analysis board, so I'm gonna click on it, it's gonna open here, and let's say I will uh, turn on the computer just kind of like to, for simplicity uh, how this can be won. So, for example, like white's running out of moves, so let's say take, we trade, trade. Uh, and now king c5 is important, so now he has to get out of the way, he goes here, uh, he can come here, and uh, he doesn't get, he doesn't get our c pawn. So we can pick it up and we, we can just push uh, both pawns, pretty easy win, pretty trivial win. Uh, yeah, so uh, that is how uh, just uh, studying and preparing, uh, learning some really good lines on chessable from uh, courses from top GMs um, occasionally um, quite often actually may work out and allow you to get a very playable position um, if you know what you're doing uh, it really helps if you play solid stuff it really helps so hopefully this video is useful to you guys uh, both in terms of seeing uh, how to prepare what to study and as well as hopefully some concept that you've seen in this game um, were useful to you as well Thank you for watching this and until next time.